But, you know, normally, in churches I've been part of uh, before, you know, they tell you it's Baptism Sunday, uh, next Sunday, and normally that is an excuse not to come. Uh, and normally you make other plans. And I was one of those people. I, I used to avoid them. Um, because, you, th- you know, you think you know what it's going to be. But last week just surprised us all, I think. We were all just blown away by the sense of God's presence and all that he was doing among us. And it was just great fun. We got in uh, this enormous pool. It was, if we're honest, slightly oversized. I had a a bit of a falling out with the church warden who thought it was perfect for the occasion. I was like, I think we'll get a smaller one next time. And she's like, no, it was absolutely brilliant. I was like, no, it wasn't. It was a bit, anyway, and that's by the by. It was a swimming pool here in in the church um, with knee-deep water and uh, we were doing some baptisms. We baptized Victoria, who's here in row two. Give it up for Victoria. <laughs> we were reaff- reaffirming some baptismal vows. I see Tom Blankin in the house. Give it up for him. <laughs> Charlotte Creese, you're around. Where are you? There she is. Give it up. It's, you know, slight theological differences, but they all went under the water. That's the key thing. And what an amazing moment. What an incredible thing to be a part of, to witness, to experience. People entering the family of God, becoming part of the people of God in a fresh way, or really for the, for the first time. And having this pool here, people walking through the door thinking, you know, I hadn't been warned, perhaps for the first time, thinking, have I come to a pool party? What's going on? Why is the vicar in his shorts? You know, why is that guy in a pair of tights, Tom Blenkin? Oh, <laughs> different outfits, different outfits. And we engaged with the waters in just a fresh and powerful way. And you know, it was one of my highlights because it is such a potent symbol and sign of all that we're called to be and to do as the church and people of God. And it was right here in our very own church. In fact, uh, we've got the water stains, the stained wooden tiles to prove it. You know, they say every scar tells a story. Well, we've got water-stained wooden tiles. Come and see it here. And when I look out, I'm just going to feel a sense of affection for those tiles because it speaks of that service. When we saw lives changed, when we spoke of the power that God has to change a life, to turn it around, and what's more, all that he did through that service, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. But it also just fired me up and excited me because it speaks of God's heart, his call for the church to be out on mission. Because we, the church of God in the 21st century, are called to exactly the same mission as the church was called to in the first century. The very first church of Jesus Christ, the very first disciples. We've been in a mini-series here at St. Dee's looking at sort of our four priorities, really, what we want to encourage every person who considers themselves a member of St. Dee's to get stuck into, which is to get connected with us as a church, to get involved using your gifts, serving, to get giving, showing your heart of generosity, your money, your time, your skills, whatever it is. And fourthly, tonight, we're looking at get out. Get out. <laughs> in a missional sense. Because we are called to the same mission as Jesus called his first apostles to, his first disciples, with the Great Commission. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but the Great Commission hasn't been fulfilled yet. There's still work to be done. We could probably all just uh, rehearse what the Great Commission is, if I was to ask you. But for those who don't know, Jesus' command to his disciples to go and make disciples Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is the mission of the church. This is our mission. This is why we are committed to that call, to get out. But tonight I want to look at how do we do that? How are we going to be an effective, potent vehicle for God's spirit, for God's mission here in the 21st century, right here in London? How are we going to do that? And in order to look at that, I I want to look at how the early church did it. Because we need help, don't we? And they seem to do it pretty effectively. And yet when you think about it, the people that were doing it, well, they're no different to you and I. (laughs) 
They were a bunch of sort of bumbling disciples who didn't really know what they were up to most of the time, who made mistakes. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors, you know, accountants of modern day stuff. They were just like us. And yet they had followed Jesus. They'd given three, three and a half years of their lives to following this man who many had said was the Messiah, was the Christ. They'd seen his miracles. They'd seen him walk on water. They'd seen him raise the dead. They'd heard his teaching. They'd seen his life, his character. They were in awe. But they'd seen him crucified. They'd seen him die and be buried in a tomb. And at that point, they ran away. I mean, who wouldn't? Your leader gets taken out. The head's chopped off. What happens to the rest? They scattered. Peter denies Jesus. And yet three days later, he rose again. He appeared to them. And he went about teaching them, gathering them, to give them download after download about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and his plans for their lives, for the church, for Israel, for the whole world. And his final teaching is to give them the great commission. His final teaching before he ascends into heaven. He ascends to sit at his father's right hand. You still with me? It's pretty crazy, isn't it? I mean, Jesus literally ascending when he goes to be with God from the earth, hovering, and then just moving steadily. I don't know what speed he went. I'm always fascinated. How quick was that? A disciple's like, and there he goes. We haven't seen this before. What's going on? And then it just says a cloud hid him from their sight. Can you see him, Peter? No. No, he's gone. Um, It's crazy. It's crazy, but it's in the Bible. And we have to believe it. We have to embrace it because it's this kind of truth that changes lives, that changes this world. Because our faith is supernatural. And it must be because what we saw... And what we see in the Bible is a group of men and women, just a ragtag bunch of followers, go from being scattered, going from being those who leg it when Jesus is crucified, who who go from denying him to those who go and change the world on its head, to being those who move in power and miracles, who preach the gospel and see thousands come to faith, as we're about to see what happened And how can we move in the same way, even here at St. Dee's? I want to look at a passage in Acts. So would you grab a Bible? We're turning to Acts chapter 2. Getting slightly ahead of ourselves in the church calendar because we're actually looking at the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost is actually to come in a few weeks' time. So we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I think the Lord will forgive us. On this one occasion. Pen, Pen, Acts chapter 2. It's in the New Testament. Page 1032. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Pentecost was a festival even back then and people would make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So there would have been thousands of Jews, of believers who'd gathered from the nations all around to come and celebrate this festival. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Just keep that passage open. We're just going to pray, and then we're going to look at it. Lord, we just, we ask for your help tonight. We ask that you would do no less than send your Holy Spirit afresh on each one of us here, your people, your church, your children. Fill us, Lord. Empower us. Give us eyes to see wonders in your word. Give us ears to hear your voice and hearts willing to respond. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you, Lord. Amen. What do we need to be the church that we want to be in the 21st century? Well, I want to say that we need two things that we see in this passage. And they both involve sound. The first thing is, we need to hear a sound. And the second thing is, we need to make a sound. We need to hear a sound. The disciples, they'd gathered finally on the Mount of Olives when Jesus was uh, giving them his final teachings and he was basically saying goodbye when he began to rise up and he disappeared into that cloud. And the book of Acts begins picking up where the Gospels finish with the disciples left staring at the cloud. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you look at it for some time? Like, is he, is he done? Is he coming back? And it literally, it starts there. It says, they were looking at this cloud and two angels, two men dressed in white, came up to them and basically said, guys, what are you doing? You know the deal. You know what he said. He's going to come back in the same way as you've seen him go. Now go to Jerusalem. You've got work to do. There's a job to be done. The Great Commission ringing in their ears, just bursting in their hearts. What do they go? What do they do? They go to Jerusalem. They hold a prayer meeting. It's a pretty good rule of thumb. If you're ever stuck with what to do, church, uh, at any point, any given moment, hold a prayer meeting. Just get praying. And they held a prayer meeting. And their pray prayer meeting went on for 10 days. Can you imagine that? I'm encouraged, excited by us doing this half night of prayer that's coming up. And that's a cracking start. And that is full on. And it will test our spiritual fitness. But 10 days? That's what they do. Why? Because they were told to wait. To wait for the promise. So they gather in the upper room, probably where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with them. All 120, 170 of the disciples. That was all that they were at this time. A number like this. Like we are tonight. That was the church in all the world. Tim prayed earlier, millions in this nation. Two billion around the world who take the name of Jesus on their lips say, I'm a Christian. Back then, 170. And they gathered to pray and to wait this ragtag band of brothers and sisters, disciples. You didn't know whether they're coming or going most of the time. And what happened? Well, let's just remind ourselves. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. What happened to those disciples that changed their lives so completely? And made them a people ready to go out into the world. To get out and turn that world on its head. What happened? They heard a sound. They heard a sound. And that sound was the Spirit of God poured out on the people of God. For the very first time. A promise prophesied in the Old Testament. A promise prophesied in the book of Joel by the prophet Joel. 
that in the last days God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, men and women, young and old, male and female. All will receive his spirit and move in his power. Why was this the promise? Because this hadn't been available to them until then. It wasn't available until the work of Christ on the cross had opened the way to God, had made possible relationship with God. When the the curtain in the temple was torn in two, men and women were able to approach God freely, but equally God was able to visit men and women. And here on the day of Pentecost, we see the Spirit of God poured out in this upper room on the church, on those early believers. And it was every one of them. You know, when we talk sometimes in church about being filled with the Holy Spirit, having an experience, having an encounter, having your hearts filled, whatever language we want to use, you know, some people tighten up. Some people get nervous. They think, okay, yeah, I've heard about that. I've not experienced it for myself, but maybe it's not for me. And you might do that because, I don't know, maybe you feel guilty. Maybe you think, I'm not worthy. You know, fine, it's for, it's for Tim. It's for, you know, the, the employed professional staff in the church. But it's not for me. I'll just watch and listen. Maybe you feel unworthy, guilty. Maybe you feel afraid. What will it mean for me? What will it feel like? What will it do? This is nothing to fear. This is the spirit of your Father in heaven who knows you better than you know yourself. And we are not worthy in ourselves. None of us is. But because of the cross, Jesus has made us worthy. He's made us righteous in his sight. We can approach the throne of grace freely. So there's nothing to stop us coming. It is for everyone. It says they they heard a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Who does that include? Everyone. Each of them had their own tongue of fire. I don't know what that looked like, but they each had one. Resting on each of them. All of them, verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of them began to speak in other tongues. These early disciples, the early church, had an encounter with God that changed their lives and changed the world. They heard a sound. And it was a sound that only God could make. It was a sound from heaven. It was the wind of God, the Spirit of God, poured out from heaven, filling that room, filling everyone. And it changed their lives. Because as Paul tells us in Romans The love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been poured out. What did it feel like? What must it have been like to be in that upper room, to have that Holy Spirit come upon them? It would have felt like just liquid love filling each one of them, overcoming them, empowering them, releasing them, freeing them. Have you had that experience? Have you heard that sound, that sound from heaven, the witness of the Spirit filling your life and telling you, you are loved, you are my child. Yes, the world, yes, everyone else, but you individually are my son, my daughter. Have you heard that sound? Because God wants each and every one of us to. And God's kingdom purposes, his mission in the world, our ability to fulfill the Great Commission and to get out requires us to know it, to experience it for ourselves. I mean, can you imagine? Tim's a dad, he's got three gorgeous kids. Can you imagine if one day one of those kids, Bex, Luke, or Emma, just came to him and were like, Dad, I'm just, you know, this is totally hypothetical. Uh, you know, Dad, um, I'm just feeling a bit weird. I'm just not sure of your love for me. Just not sure how you feel about me. It's making, I just feel a bit so scared. I feel a bit, I don't know whether to approach you or not. I, I'm just unsure. Can you imagine what Tim would do if he heard that? Do you think he'd be like, oh, I'm just going to go and hide 
over here. <laughs> you can hide behind a closed door. People think God hides from them. People think God doesn't want them to know. Do you think he'd just sit there like, silent? Okay, as you were. I can tell you, I've seen his heart for his kids. I've seen his tears for his kids. He wouldn't hesitate for a moment. He would wrap them in his arms. He would speak words of life, words of love over that child until they were left in no uncertain terms of how much he loved them, of how much he adored them, of how secure and safe with him they were. That's what he'd do because he's their father. And it's exactly the same with God for us. And this is what the Holy Spirit brings us. This is what that first sound is all about. It's about bringing us to a knowledge of God's love for us. The Jews just strung out, Israel strung out and trying to fulfill the law, trying to do their best in a dry and thirsty land, knowing so little of God's presence, hearing so little of God's word. And yet here on Pentecost, getting full access, the Spirit of God poured out the love of God, filling their hearts, the promise of God, come. What did it feel like? Felt like that, whatever that is. And their hearts exploded. We see their response. Because a crowd gathers, they hear them praising, just declaring the wonders of God. Because when you know you're loved, when you experience that goodness, you cannot but overflow. It manifests out of you, doesn't it? I mean, when you're in a good mood, some of you might even sing. Do you know what I mean? Or we whistle at least, or hum, British, when we walk. (laughs) They experienced, they heard that sound. And their lives were transformed. What's that sound about? It is the sound that only God can give. It is the sound of heaven. And it's the sound that we as a church need to hear afresh, that every generation needs needs to hear afresh from God the Father to be empowered. It's a sound that will change your life, but it's a sound that not all, all of us hear. There was a preacher in part of the second um, great awakening called Charles Finney who ministered in New York um, and he was an amazing man he saw uh, he was a revivalist and a great preacher and he spoke about his experience of the Holy Spirit uh, of a Pentecost like this he says as I turned and was about to take a seat by the fire I received a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit without any expectation of it without ever having the thought in my mind that there was any such thing for me is there any of us here Without any recollection that I'd I'd ever heard the thing mentioned by any person in the world, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. For I could not express it in any other way. It seemed like the very breath of God. I can recollect distinctly that it seemed to fan me like immense wings. No words can express the wonderful love that was shed abroad in my heart. I wept aloud with joy and love, and I do not know, but I should say I literally bellowed out the unutterable gushings of my heart. These waves came over me and over me and over me, one after the other, until I recollect I cried out, I shall die if these waves continue to pass over me. I said, Lord, I cannot bear any more. Yet I had no fear of death. Is that your experience? I mean, it's it's quite strong, isn't it? (laughs) Is that mine? It's available to us all. That is the sound of heaven that God wants to, indeed God needs to bring to each one of us if we're to fulfill our kingdom mandate, if we're to, conf- to fulfill the great commission, we need to hear the sound of heaven. The disciples heard that sound. And like I mentioned, they began praising God. They began declaring his wonders. And we read that those thousands who'd gathered, those pilgrims who were walking the streets, and the streets of Jerusalem are very tightly together, they heard something kicking off. They heard all these praises, all this noise. And this noise drew a crowd 
They began to head over there and say, what is going on over here? Did you see that in the passage? It says in verse 6, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. When they heard what sound? The sound of heaven? The sound of the wind? No. That sound is for the church. That sound was for the people of God. That was their experience, being filled with the love of God. No, the sound that drew the crowd was the sound of the church in response to, the, response to that first sound. So I joked on Facebook, has any of you been to the ministry of sound? We need to go first to the ministry of sound, man. <laughs> no, joking apart, get, the, get that slide up, Oliver. There. That... Funny enough, is the Ministry Ministry of Sound logo. It's a big club, if you don't know, a big nightclub in London. And people go to the Ministry of Sound looking for all kinds of things. And ironically, they're looking for the very thing that God wants to give them. An overwhelming sense of love, connection, community. What does that logo say to you? Tried it on someone yesterday, drew a blank. Uh, It says to me, there's a globe. A globe representing the earth in the middle. Above that, there is a crown and there is a cross. There is the Lordship of Christ right there in their logo. Around the earth, we see ministry of sound written. Speaks of the voice of the Lord, which we know from Scripture, fills the whole earth, is available to be heard at any given moment. Thank you, Ollie. You made my point. These men and women, these disciples had visited the ministry of sound. They'd heard that sound of heaven and they went out and made a sound. And the sound they make draws a crowd, draws thousands. And in response to that, seeing the crowd gather, Peter gets up and he preaches the first gospel message that we read about in the New Testament. He preaches the gospel and 3,000 get added to their number that day. People are cut to the heart. They are convicted. And you know what he says? He says, repent and be baptized. What we were doing last week. When the people of God hear the sound of heaven, they cannot but make other sounds. You see, our ministry, our calling is to a ministry of echoes. We are merely called to echo the sound that we hear from heaven. When God moves in our hearts, we pass it on. We make a noise for him. We hear his noise, we make a noise. We hear that sound, we make a sound. We open our mouth. We do whatever we can to declare his glory. Does that make sense? And when the church are kicking off, when they're doing all this hullabaloo, a crowd gathers And that's what we want to be about as a church. We want to be a people that gather a crowd, don't we? Yeah, I long to see thousands coming to know Jesus. I long to see us needing to get our own baptism pool, a smaller version uh, of last week, because we are baptizing people week in and week out. I'm not satisfied, hopefully in a godly way, with what we've got, and neither is God. His heart is for more. He wants men and women around this nation, around this city to know his love, to come to faith in him. And this is why I get excited about things that draw a crowd. This is why I was excited about last week, about the baptism service, because we put it on and people getting baptized or reaffirming, invited friends, invited people to come along and hear their story, to see them go under the waters. We had faces, we had people in this building who aren't normally here. I love seeing most of your faces week in, week out. But Tim and I, we get particularly excited when we see a face we don't know. Because it might mean that God is doing something. He's drawing men and women who don't yet know him to come and hear about him. And last week, we put on something. We held a service that drew a crowd. And that crowd got to hear the gospel. And God was at work powerfully. We heard stories coming out of of last week of how um, friends of those being baptised had, uh, well, there was one girl who'd been poking fun at one of our members here on a ski trip, uh, been slightly mocking her faith and going to church and all that stuff. 
Not necessarily in an unkind way, but anyway, you know how it is. She came, she witnessed, she saw the baptism. Later that night, she was sending 10, 11, 12 messages saying what an amazing time it had been. What an amazing event. And how she wants to start coming to church. Isn't that great? Another guy who's been friends with one of the, the people going under the waters for 25 years, doesn't go near a church, texted later that night, that night or the next day saying, something happened to me during that service. I experienced something. I want to get together with you and talk about it. Can we meet up this week? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? They were drawn by the sound that the church was making, by us sending Facebook invites, emails, whatever, phone calls saying, come, come in here, come and be part of this. There was someone here last week who's here tonight. I won't embarrass them. But they came because they've recently become friends with one of our members here, uh, one of the girls. And that girl is the first Christian he's ever known, he's ever been friends with. That's the generation we live in, guys. A generation growing up with no knowledge of Christian things, with no Christian contact, with no Christian friends. And she was the first Christian he'd known. And she invited him to this service. And he came through the doors. This is the first Christian service he's ever come to. And he experienced something which touched him deeply. And he prayed with her and another of our guys at the end. He prayed a prayer, basically saying, Lord, I want to come to know you. I want to begin this journey of faith. Committing to know you more. I want to know this love I've heard about. He prayed a prayer committing to that journey with Christ. He's here tonight for the second time. Isn't that amazing? He describes that he left. He says, it felt like I was walking on air. Isn't that what we want? Well, church, that happens when we, the church, hear the sound of heaven and we go out and make a sound, inviting people to come and hear. And that's what we're about here at St. D's. We want to be a church about the mission of God. We want to play our part in fulfilling the Great Commission. We want to quite literally get out. It's not just that we get out. We come back. We go out. We come back. It's like in, out, in. Shake it. No, I don't know what. I didn't plan that. It's horrid. I don't know why I went there. Sorry. <laughs> it's like breathing. Tonight, we're breathing in. We're hearing the sound of heaven afresh. We're being empowered but only so that we can go out there and live confidently for Christ in the nine to five, in the Monday to Friday, at our workplaces, in a world that doesn't know, doesn't recognize Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This is what we do. But we put on things, we put on events, we gather in order to make a sound so the world might come, the world might come and hear. And here at St. Dee's, we are encouraging all kinds of initiatives, all kinds of things we want to see God do, that we want to release Kingdom entrepreneurialism, if you like. And there's just one or two people I just want to speak to very quickly tonight to hear a heart for that. Um, thanks, Tim. The first is Francesca. Are you here? Give it up for Ches. <laughs> Ches, why don't you tell us... Um, couple of the things you are sort of kicking off and your hopes with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, can I just take a step back for a moment though? I guess, you know, all these things are kicking off or things that I've been doing for a little while now. But I just wanted to say, I suppose, like the heart of that is definitely to see community shared more than anything else. And actually, mm. you know, not just, I guess like in this building as well, as people come to be part of our family and start to go to church here, for them to find a home and a place and a real family. And I think that's catching, it's contagious. And there are a lot of people in London who are really lonely. Not just in London, it was the same when I lived in Sydney or Edinburgh, who really crave a family, who crave you know, somewhere to belong and people to belong to. And actually, when you start initiatives like that, it's just, it does draw people. It's that noise that you're talking about, Pat, mm. that people want to be near, they want to get close to. Is that real, authentic community and love that we have yeah so I guess just from that just a little bit of background there I, like you know that's always been a passion of mine is to see relationships build and people get to know each other so a couple of things I'm involved in one was actually started by Jesse and I just took over the reins which is a netball team um, so we play every Monday night um, we've had a bit of a long break because I'm Australian I'm a soft so I can't handle all the rain in winter but now the sun is out again we're playing again on Monday nights 
And um, last season it was amazing. We had a lot of girls from St. Dee's, but we also had a lot of girls who don't go to church um, there as well. And it was, as we were talking about, just that sense of community, playing together every week, going to the pub together. Um, we're playing again starting in a week or so. Um, our team's pretty full, but like, you know, if anyone else has got a heart for that, I would just say get out there and start a team because it's such a great thing to do and it's so accessible. Um, the other thing is a bit hilarious because I didn't actually intend it to be missional. I just really like drinking wine. So <laughs> I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have like a wine club? You know, I'd like to learn more about European wine because I know lots about Australian wine, but not much about European wine. <laughs> mm, that's better. So, yeah. Jokes. Well, no, I don't think so. We've okay. just finished European wine, actually. We're about to move to New World, and I'm quite excited about this. But anyway, like, um, basically, when I got that started, it's just been really amazing the way, I suppose, God's been speaking to me more about it. Because it was just like a, you know, I guess being new in London, I wanted to get to know a few more people and even, you know, just start to connect some of my friends. Because what you find when you move here is you're often just going around meeting, you know, tons of people for coffees but you're not actually building any community 